Hi, welcome back to the Eldritch Hearth. I came upon this case after investigating several others, including the Bobby Dunbar case, the Wineville chicken coop murders, and the Walter Collins disappearance. This is the case of Francis Marion Parker's murder. Trigger warning for child death, suicide, and mutilation. This is a rough one. On December 15th, at 1927, a young man walked into the lobby of the Mount Vernon Junior High School in Lafayette Square in Los Angeles, California, and he asked the secretary, Mrs. Marion Holt, if he could please see the daughter of Perry Parker. Mrs. Holt inquired, which daughter? And the young man seemed a bit taken aback before answering, the younger one. Because Mrs. Holt was unaware that Marjorie and Marion Parker were twins, she pulled Marion Parker out of class and brought him to the office to see the young man. The young man stated that her father, Perry, had been in a car accident and he had requested her to come to the hospital to be with him. As he walked out the door with her, he was heard to say, don't worry, I'm going to take you to your father, everything's going to be fine. However, in that afternoon, when Mary did not return home from school, her father, Perry, a prominent baker in Los Angeles, called the school and asked into her whereabouts. The school informed him that she had been picked up by a strange man because he had been in an accident. Perry knew then that something terrible had happened to his daughter. A telegram soon arrived at the Parker home stating, do positively nothing until you receive special delivery letter. The Parker home then received a flurry of special delivery letters and telegrams that evening, informing them that Marion had in fact been kidnapped. The kidnapper then demanded $1,500 in gold certificates. The various telegrams and letters were signed, the Fox, Fate, Death, and the Greek word for death. Some of the letters also came in Marion's handwriting and begged her father to please cooperate so she could come home. 24 long hours later, the location was set for the ransom exchange, and Perry carefully recorded the serial number of each dollar bill so that way they could be followed. Perry traveled to the location that the kidnapper had set. However, the police followed him from his home. The kidnapper saw this and failed to show up for the exchange. A telegram arrived the next morning, scolding Perry for involving the media and the police. He threatened to kill Marion that day and said, Fox is my name, very sly, you know. Set no traps, I'll watch for them. Get this straight. Remember that life hangs by a thread. I have a Gillette ready and am able to handle the situation. Several more phone calls that day and into the evening established the new location as West 5th Street and 2nd Manhattan Place. Mr. Parker received a call at 7.15 that evening telling him to leave. He arrived alone at the location around 8 p.m. A Chrysler Coupe pulled up next to Perry's car and a man wearing a bandana over his face demanded the money and pulled out a gun. Perry could see his daughter sitting in the front seat. She didn't appear to be moving, but her eyes were open, so he assumed that she had been drugged. As soon as the money had gone into the kidnapper's hands, he pulled away, opened the door, shouted, there's your daughter, and threw a bundle out onto the grass. When Perry approached it, he realized immediately that his daughter Marion was dead. He called the police, and the coroner soon discovered that Marion's arms and legs had been cut off. She had been disemboweled and her torso had been stuffed with a towel and a man's shirt and her eyes had been sewn open to give the appearance that she was still alive. The coroner also determined that Marion had been dead for nearly 12 hours, which means that she had still been alive when the police fouled up the previous ransom exchange. The next morning, strollers through Elysian Park nearby found her arms and legs. The details of her horrific death were leaked to the press and immediately there was a surge of attention. Over 20,000 police officers and volunteers began searching for her kidnapper and a reward of over $100,000 was offered for the identification and capture of the kidnapper, dead or alive. There was such a panic over the search for Marion's kidnapper that Mexico actually closed its borders to ensure that he couldn't escape down there. This became known as the year that California forgot about Christmas. On December 20th, the kidnapper's getaway car, which had been stolen from Kansas City, Missouri, was discovered and fingerprints were lifted from it. While that part of the investigation was ongoing, they also discovered on the towel that had been shoved into her abdomen a laundry mark from the Bellevue Arms Apartments. Asking around the apartments, people made note of a new tenant named Donald Evans. 
There are two different versions of what happened next. In one, the police approached Donald Evans and asked him to if they could take a look through his apartment. He allowed this, they found nothing suspicious, and they left. In the second version, Evans simply wasn't there. However, when the fingerprints came back, they were linked to William Edward Hickman, who had been a former co-worker of Perry Parker at the first Los Angeles National Bank. The year before, Perry had reported Hickman for forgery and stolen checks, and the young man had been convicted and sentenced to six months probation. The police returned to the apartment of Donald Evans, which was then verified to actually belong to William Hickman. Inside, they found a bloody footprint and burned pieces of the ransom letters. One man who matched Hickman's description was arrested seven times in a single day. Another was beaten by a mob, and when the police took him into custody for his own protection, he then hung himself in his cell. Hickman fled north, and there were several sightings of him in Oregon and in Washington, and in one location he spent several of the gold certificates buying himself a new set of clothing. He was arrested on December 22nd in Echo, Oregon. At first upon his arrest, he claimed that he had been working with Oliver and Frank Kramer. However, once the police began doing their research into it, they discovered that both Oliver and Frank were in prison during this time. Hickman then confessed to the crime a bit gleefully, along with confessing to a series of armed robberies, including one that had occurred on December 24th, 1926, where he and young Welby Hunt dressed in Santa Claus masks and attempted to rob a drugstore and this resulted in the death of the druggist Clarence Ivy Toms. During the trial, Hickman claimed insanity. California had recently changed its not guilty by reason of insanity laws, and he did his best to capitalize on this, claiming that a supernatural entity named Providence had ordered him to commit the murder. This did not fit in with several other statements that he made, including that he had committed the murder in order to get money to go to college, and hoping that he would be more famous than Leopold and Loeb. At one point, he even asked the prison guards how he could act crazy. When jurors were shown pictures of poor little Marion's body during the trial, one woman fainted and several men were reduced to tears. It took only 36 minutes for them to return with a guilty of verdict, and he was sentenced to hang. Hickman and Wilby Hunt were also found guilty of the murder of Clarence Ivy Toms. Hunt, who was 15 at the time of the crime, was originally given a life sentence, but he was paroled in 1939 and pardoned in 1942. Hickman died by hanging on October 19th, 1828 in San Quentin prison. Marion's mother said that she was what would be known now as a tomboy. She did not like dolls or tea parties. She liked toy trains and scooters and baseball and football and had recently built a model train in their living room. The 12 year old girl was also known to be shy and was afraid of the dark. The story was so well known and so well publicized and so upsetting that several folk songs were written about it. You can find them here on YouTube. And Anne Rand saw Hickman as her sort of Nietzschean Superman. She said that William Hickman was the best and strongest expression of a real man's psychology that she had ever heard of. She would later go on to base the character Danny Renahan from the unpublished story The Little Street upon William Hickman. Marion was cremated and is in Forest Home Cemetery in Los Angeles, California. I hope you enjoyed that little piece of Los Angeles history. I'll be back on Tuesday with another story. Until then, Bingo Beaver and I hope you do attend.